Like as the waves make towards the pibbled shore, so do our minutes hasten towards their end. Each one follows that which goes before, and sequent toil all forward do contend. Nativity, once in the main of light, crawls to maturity, wherewith being crowned, crooked eclipses against its glory fight, and time that gave doth now its gift confound. Time doth transfix the flourish set on youth, delves the parallels in beauty's brow, feeds on the rarities of nature's truth, and nothing stands but for its scythe to mow. And yet, to times in hope, my verse shall stand, praising thy worth despite its cruel hand. So, Shakespeare wrote this sonnet in 1590, about 10 years before the turn of the 17th century. And I discovered it in about 1990, 10 years before the 21st century. And I found myself in the post office sorting parcels in the cold of the winter on my winter break from college. And I had no idea that someday I'd be standing in front of this beautiful crowd in Yearling Road as the state climatologist of Ohio to talk about climate change and time. Instead, I had a gut-wrenching discontent that was growing. My chosen history major and some fuzzy vision of a law career were just not jiving with my passion for mountains and glaciers and water. I knew somehow that something had to change, and I found some solidarity with the bard, not to mention maybe some similar highbrow, questionable hairstyles. <laughs> but it was an important moment, almost like the Hamlet moment when I was looking at the skull of my own life and realizing that the limits of my own mortality were kind of a motivational factor to get changing. But it was also those last two lines of the sonnet really gripped my heart because it was this courageous stand against our mortality because I really think inside each of us there's this eternity that reaches beyond. And so I knew that I had to do something to change my circumstances. Now I now have wonderful time markers in the form of my kids that are standing here on the pibbled shore of Peru. And Peru becomes an important part of my story I want to share tonight for bringing together some of my passions professionally. But what I want to say is that time is the denominator of change. And it's not just mathematical, although it is that. It's existential. And I think there's something about the way that we come in common experience time and change that has important implications for the way that we as a society are dealing or not with the reality of climate change. And so I think by putting time in the denominator, I want to show how science has been able to quantify the rate of change and show how actually we are very uncommon right now in the way that we're experiencing climate change when we compare it against all of our history. So for millennia, for thousands of years up until Shakespeare's time, humanity had experienced time as the seasons and the rising and setting of the sun, the natural progression. However, Around about 1590, the new urban realities of the world were opening up, and society was going through massive changes. Chocolate was getting from the new world to England. Imagine that, along with coffee. How radical of a change. And all of this is played off by Shakespeare by naming his sonnet number 60, and that's deliberate because it's the number of minutes in the hour. And suddenly, time was now being quantified by an absolute measure and reference frame. And think of the implications. I mean, I learned in that post office the brutal reality of an hourly wage. We valorize time in a different way. Moreover, once science got a hold of absolute measures, we could make observations. And these observations were going to counteract intuitive worldviews. Think of Galileo. His observations of the solar system were going to question our fundamental precepts about Earth's centrality and put the sun in the middle. And it wasn't going to be easy in his transformation. He suffered. Coincidentally or not, he also was the first guy to measure temperature, come up with a thermometer. And he was able to look at the change of kinetic energy in air and come up with an absolute reference frame. And so for us as climatologists, suddenly we were able to put a number 
a change in temperature to the daily progression that we normally have experienced just as the sun coming and going in a given day, the seasons passing. And there's then a way we could analyze these changes. And there's all sorts of features we could look at in, in a waveform like this. Climatology has a lot of waves. I could show you a graph like this. As the state climatologist of Ohio, here is the summary of our daily temperatures for the, for the whole year of 2017. And you notice that for any given day, the interval between maximum and minimum temperatures varies. It's quite chaotic. That's the weather. But overall, you see a nice arc and a waveform that shows our warming in the summer and our cooling towards the winter. And if we were to take a long-term average, say over 30 years, which is the climate normal period, we could see how those variations narrow. And we get a nice even waveform that shows us what we can expect for highs and low temperatures and the range over the year, month to month in Ohio. This is a great moment to remind us all that weather's not the same thing as climate. So here's my son uh, dressed for our first Buckeye game just a few weeks ago when it was the middle of a deluge. We had to be prepared for the exact conditions of the atmosphere at a specific time and place, and that's the weather. And weather in this regard is like the outfit. So we had to don these nice colorful uh, ponchos to sit and watch our first game. Well, if we take that same analogy, climate would be much more like the wardrobe that we wear, okay? That we have to be prepared for the full range of temperatures. So climate, by definition, is the long-term statistics of weather over many decades. It's not something we can get instantaneously. So we have to have a long-term basis of average. And so here we are in Peru, as a family, ready for the full range of geographic conditions from the desert coast to the high glacial mountains near 20,000 feet, and then back down to the Amazon rainforest, stopping, of course, by Machu Picchu. And we had to pack quite a lot of clothes. We also, of course, brought our Buckeye pride to our Peruvian host family. Climate, when we look at it globally and expand our vision, encapsulates this variability that we see season to season. And you can see nicely in this photo montage that goes through a year over and over again with cloud-free satellite images, the growth and decay of snow in the northern hemisphere, the greening and browning of our mesophytic forests in this part of the world. You can see the shift of solar maximum around the equator. Well, what happens if we start to take a close account in a quantitative measure of the temperature change over the entire globe? And this assemblage is what we get. And this is showing you average conditions of time in four-year windows from the point of which we started to be able to get reliable measures of temperature back in the 1880s. And you can see there's warmer and cooler periods. Spatially, it's variable. But as that time increment grows closer and closer to the present, notice how the colors get yellower and redder. What we're seeing when we quantify the global average conditions is a decidedly non-waveform of climate. Things are getting warmer. If we were to graph this as the temperature change from the average, you could see that there is a fair bit of year-to-year -year variability and waves. There's some structure there, some warm periods in the 40s and cooling off again. But what's happening most recently since the 60s and 70s is an unequivocal rise and that those waveforms are not coming back down. The total change we've seen over this time, about a degree centigrade or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit over the last 100 years. And if we put that into a longer time perspective, we can see how, for example, over the year 1000 to 2000, temperatures as reconstructed from natural archives in ice cores and corals and tree rings show a kind of cooling. But then those observations at the end rise abruptly. It's almost like a hockey stick on end. And that's what they call this, the hockey stick curve. And if we go back to a time when natural climate was much different, 20,000 years ago, we would have been sitting here in Whitehall with about a mile thick slab of ice over us in the last glacial maximum. And coming out of that, we would have risen up into the Holocene that started about 10,000 years ago 
And you can see that that was a mean annual temperature change for the planet on the order of about 5 degrees centigrade. Well, if you average that over the 5,000 year interval, you get about a 0.1 degree change in temperature per century. Well, keep in mind what I just told you. That most recent change we're seeing now looks almost like a straight line up. It's about nine times faster at about 0.9 degrees for 100 years. And if we then go and go into the future, that line continued just to go straight up by model projections. This, by the way, is called the wheelchair curve because it kind of looks like that profile of a wheelchair. Well, just like climate's the long-term spatial average, I personally had to get out and travel the world to find my kind of passion and change in my career. And it brought me to Peru. Thanks to the Fulbright organization, I lived for a full year there as a dissertation student, literally tracing ancient glaciers to figure out the relative rates of change. And you can see here how I'm standing on the slope of an ancient moraine, which is a pile of debris left by a huge extent of the glaciers that then dammed some beautiful colored lakes. The modern glaciers are high and steep compared to these much larger glaciers. But when I started to then quantify the change we saw in the ancient glaciers versus the modern, I could compare rates of change. And this is what I saw. The Anna Moray Glacier in 1998, when I first got to Peru, looked something like this. By 2015, when I was back there on sabbatical, it was much more decreased. And if you can look carefully, you can see not only the frontal extent of that glacier, but in the middle of the glacier, we've seen 100 meters of vertical change. So this is a massive volume change. And in fact, when we quantify this, by our best estimates of the ancient extent of glaciers, things are happening now at a rate 2 to 12 times faster than we could have predicted. Well, why is this happening? There's many other TED Talks that can go into much more detail about this. I'm going to just summarize from a Trump-approved report that came out last year. The Climate Science Special Report shows unequivocally that it's really human forcing that's causing this. And here, when we think about what we want to do to prevent much more warming, the, the most recent report that came out this very month from the IPCC runs a scenario to see what it would take for us to stop warming at one and a half degrees. We've already warmed a degree. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to cut carbon emissions to about zero by 2050? That's 30 years from now. Well, here's what I got to concede my limits. I don't have an answer to this. Science doesn't have an answer to how we can change. I can't imagine how to do this because, frankly, I'm addicted to oil. All of my life trajectory that I showed you was premised on cheap hydrocarbons in the form of fossil fuels. Flying repeatedly to Ireland to court and then marry the belle of Belfast City, my beautiful bride, took a lot of fossil fuels. So I want to wrap this up by reminding us that science has a certain role here. We can measure and give us some sense about how we might change. And this is a quote from another Belfastian, born in Belfast, moved to Glasgow University, Lord Kelvin, famous for the Kelvin temperature scale and thermodynamic in insights, really a revolutionary thinker. And he put it this way, to measure is to know. If you can't not measure it, you cannot improve it. And he had great uh, prowess with this adage. However, he's also a good example of some of the limitations of the imagination of science. He went to his deathbed convinced that we'd never see flight. No balloon or no aeroplane will ever practically be successful. Look at his death, it was 1907. Well, it wasn't just a couple years later when a couple hardworking bicycle brothers from Ohio proved him wrong. And so I want to bring us back to where I started, and I think it comes back to this eternal desire to be beyond ourselves. And I think change is a commitment to a just everyday persistent change inspired by something bigger than ourselves where we lay aside our own egos and get on with business that's different. And just like an addict who needs recovery through a whole community to face those objective facts, we have to reach for some hope. And now I don't really have the answer, but I do have a couple examples that I can share with. And you can spell hope in your own way. I think there's an infinite variety. Uh, I'm kind of favoring this one recently, harnessing organic potential energy. Did you know that the first windmill 
was created right here in Ohio. In 1888, Charles Brush up in Cleveland had this wonderful monstrosity going to power his mansion with a whole bed of batteries for 14 years. 50 feet wide was only generating 12 kilowatts, but he figured out the dynamo and the storage capacity for this energy. This is not beyond us. Another great inspirational example, Jim Probst of West Virginia, who grew his whole life within the coal industry, now retired as a cabinet maker, is inspired to think about the world he's leaving behind for his grandkids. And he's taking an active role in just advocating for a way to price carbon to come up with some solutions that could equitably address this problem. He calls it climate justice. Well, again, I think we all have our own source of hope, but it comes from this eternal part of us that I believe extends our finite mortality. And I really think that despite the suffering that's upon us and that will be upon us, I have to be a realist, I do think we can never lose sight of that infinite hope. And I believe that we can change our lives and not our climate. Thank you very much.